So today we continue to talk about uh, network flows and bipartite matching. Uh, uh, our goal will be to find the better algorithm to find the bipartite matching, which is Hopkirk-Karp algorithm. But we'll start with the flows. So uh, in the two previous lectures, we discussed several different algorithms uh, to solve the maximum flow problem. Uh, now let's revisit all of them and think about the following problem. <clears throat> uh, one of the important cases of the maximal fl flow problem is the case when all the edges have a unit uh, capacity. So if the capacity of each edge is equal to one. Uh, let's revisit all our algorithms we discussed in previous lectures and uh, think what will be the time complexity of this algorithm if, the, if all the edges of the graph have, have, have unit capacity. For example, let's see, let's start with a simple Ford Falkerson algorithm. So if we simply try to find any uh, augmenting path in a, a residual network and push the flow uh, through this uh, augmenting path. So let's say for Falkerson. So simple Ford Falkerson algorithm works in the time uh, uh, Fm, right? So each time we increase the flow by at least once, by, by at least one, and uh, the, uh, how, how we do it, we find any uh, path from S to T and push the flow through this path. Uh, so th this is the time complexity of this algorithm. <coughs> uh, yeah, simple graph. Okay, we'll talk about simplicity. So now, what will happen if I say that in my graph all edges has unique capacity? So if the capacity of each edge is equal to one, what will be the time complexity for this case? Again, again, worst time is time complexity. So to, to analyze the worst time, time complexity, we need to find the upper, upper bound for the value of the flow. So what, what may be the maximal possible value for the flow in the network if it has n, n vertices and m edges? <coughs> well, simple upper bound is basically m. So if you have m edges, you cannot push more than m flow from S to T, right? So this f may be up to m. So m complexity is no more than m square. Yeah. Yes, right. But what's, what if graph is simple? What if we forbid to use any parallel edges? So if we say that all capacities are unit and no parallel edges, no parallel and yes. Then you're right. If, if there is no parallel edges, then, then uh, you can you can push more than n flow from vertex S. So you have vertex S, they may be up to n edges from the node S, so you can't push more than n units of flow from S. So time complexity will be nm actually. Right. Good. Let's move next. What about Edmonds Carp algorithm? Edmonds Carp, it's K. It's K, right? <laughs> yep. Edmonds Carp algorithm. What will be the term complexity of the Edmonds Carp algorithm? Uh, again, uh, for. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Here. Here it will be. Adam score, right? So it's complexity of Edmonds Carp. Edmonds Carp algorithm is algorithm when we find sh always find the shortest possible path. So we use BFS instead of DFS. Uh, so we prove that the time complexity will be NM square. What about these cases? Will it be better? Actually, not much. Uh, no, we can definitely say that time complexity will be not slower than for the Ford Falkerson algorithm because, we, again, we just each time we find any shortest in, in the Ford Falkerson algorithm, find any shortest path, 
Here we find the sh a a any augmenting path from S to T. Here we find the shortest augmenting path. But still we find some short special where we push at least one, one unit of the flow each time. So the time complexity will be no worse than for fourth fault personal algorithm. Okay. <clears throat> and now let's finally talk about Dini's algorithm. Dini's algorithm is a very different situation. Uh, Dini's algorithm again, let's remind you, time complexity was n square m, or we updated it for using some uh, very sophisticated things. We use link card trees to, up, to optimize it to uh, n m log n, but it was kind of scary. But what if we use just the simple Dini's algorithm without all these link card trees and stuff, just simple Dini's algorithm? What will be the time complexity? Uh, let's see. So what's the difference? What will happen in each stage of the Dini's algorithm? So in each, uh, how it's called, in each phase of the Dini's algorithm, we build a layered network. That's again, so how the Dini's algorithm works. We have this, we have this layered network. Yeah, like this. And now using, using this network, we try to, to find the shortest augmenting paths. So we find augmenting paths like this. We take any road from S to T and push the flow through this, through this path, yeah? Uh, so in this time complexity here, what we, what we did prove that each time when you push the flow of this path, at least one edge will be removed. Yeah. So each time you push the flow, you remove at least one edge. So you have M edges. So this is why we have this M. So each time we remove one edge from the network. And we do it at most N times because we rebuild this network in time N. Yeah. yeah. So each time we increase the distance, so the, there will be at most N stages of the Dini's algorithm, so the total time complexity will be n multiplied by m, multiplied by n is the time to find this path. Yeah? So we find this path in time n, there are m edges, uh, so the, each phase of the Dini's algorithm works in n m time, and there may be up to n phases of this Dini's algorithm, so total complexity will be n squared by, by m. Yeah? So this is just what happened in the previous lecture. What will happen here is, uh, uh, since all the edges have unit capacity, when we push this flow, we will remove not one edge, but all of them, yeah, right? So all of them have unit capacity. So when you push the unit of the flow uh, through this path, you will remove all these edges from the uh, residual network, right? So you remove all these edges from residual network. That's, that, that's the core difference, right? So how to analyze time complexity? Again, we have n phases of the Dini's algorithm. In each phase, we build this uh, uh, layered network. And now we try to find augmenting paths. Each time we spend some time to find this augmenting path, and then we remove all the edges in this path. So the total time of finding all the possible augmenting path is still linear, yeah? Because again, we, we spend some time and then remove all the edges. Total time we spend will be the total number of the edges. So the, each phase of the Dini's algorithm has time complexity m, right? So time complexity will work like this. We have, we have n phases of the Dini's algorithm and each phase has time complexity m. And the same here, actually. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Is it clear by number? But that's that's not all. Uh, the interesting thing is the time complexity is even better. Uh, it's even better because we actually don't have n phases in this Dini's algorithm. 
So if you have unit capacities of, of all the edges, uh, then the number of phases of the Dini's algorithm can be bounded, bounded even uh, better than this n. So, so n, n, n is a simple bounds. So you can't have more than n phases of the Dini's algorithm, right? but it's, it's even less than n. Let's prove two interesting bounds for this. Uh, first bound is the following. Uh, let's prove that if we have capacities of one for all edges, then there will be up to uh, square root of n uh, phases of these uh, phases. Let us confess. I don't know the good word for this. Iteration is some, something small. It's not iteration, it's something big, right? Let's call it phase, okay? Let's prove it, let's prove it. Uh, why is it true? Uh, let's do the following, let's do the following. Let's see, what happens in each phase of the Dini's algorithm? We build layer network, then we find all shortest path of this length. So first we find all shortest path of length one. Then we find all possible shortest path of paths of length two, then of length three, and so on, up to square root of n. So let's make the first square root of n phases of the Dini's algorithm. What happens after we make these first square root of n phases? Uh, there will be si still some augmenting paths left, right? So after we find all the short paths, there will be some long paths. So all augmenting paths now are long paths. So in, in the current residual network, there still be uh, maybe, maybe some augmenting paths, but they all have length at least square root of m. Yeah. All augmenting paths have length at least square root of m. Right? Well, just because we removed all short paths in the first square root of m steps. Now, now let's see. Uh, let's see the difference between the maximal flow and the current flow. So let's see. Delta f is just the difference between maximal flow and current flow. This delta f can be decomposed into some set of paths, right? So let's decompose this f into some set of augmenting paths. So there will be some, so, so this is delta f. It will look like this, we have s, then we have some augmenting path, then we have another augmenting path. Uh, this path are, uh, how it's called? Uh, edge disjoint. Yeah. Yeah. They may they may have the same vertices, but all the ed edges are different. Yeah. Uh, why is it so? Because each edge has a capacity of one. So when we decompose the flow into some uh, set of paths, uh, each edge could belong only to one of these paths. Yeah, because, because the, again, again the capacity. Of, so we, we decompose the flow into set of paths. Uh, and then we push like one flow through this path. So if, if one edge belongs to two different paths, then we will push two units of the flow through this edge. It can happen, so, yeah. So the, this difference will be decomposed into set of paths and they will be edge disjoint paths. Yeah. Now, the length of, of all these paths is at least uh, square root of m. Mm -hmm. So now we have some paths. The length of each path is at least square root of m. So there may be no more than square root of m paths. Total number of edges is m. Yeah. So the total number of these paths should be no more than square root of m. Right. Again, because each edge belongs only to one of these paths. 
So since we, since the length of e each path contains square root of m edges, so the maximal number of paths is like m divided by square root of m. Mm -hmm. What does it mean? It means that the difference between maximal flow and the current flow is no more than square root of m. But in each phase of Dini's algorithm, we find at least one augmenting path. Yeah? So we build all this network and we will find at least one path. Since we build this network in such a way that there is a path. Yeah? So in all remaining phases, only at, at most square root of m phases will be uh, like, we'll find at least one augmenting path. So after you finish all these short phases, there will be some long phases, but so we will sound so this phase and this phase and this phase. But the number in each of these phases, you find at least one augmenting path. So the total, the total number of all these phases will be at most square root of m. So the total number of, of, of the phases of the Dini's algorithm is at most m, square root of m plus square root of m here. So you have square root of m here plus no more than square root of m here. So it's no more than 2 square root of m. That's all, that's all. That's very easy explanation. So uh, the time complexity here is not actually nm, but it is square root of m. Okay, let's, let's say, okay, uh, let's say m power uh, 3 over like this. <laughs> so it's m multiplied by square root of m. Right? And here also. Mm -hmm. That's all. Um, okay, that's the first interesting bound for the number of, of the phases of Dean's algorithm. The next interesting bound is uh, for the case when we have no parallel edges. So if, again, if the capacities equal to one and no parallel edges. Parallel edges. Then number of phases will be no more than n power two over three. Well, you can say that the f is no more than n, so we'll have nm. But I, I believe square root of m is better than n usually. So if your graph, again, no, it's only if your graph has no parallel edges. Okay, if you if if you allow to use parallel edges, then square root of m can actually be more than n. Yeah. Okay, you can remove it. Okay, let's okay, let's let, let's update it. So let's say it's. Uh, minimum of n and square root of m multiplied by m, like this. <laughs> That's a little bit more accurate, right? <laughs> now, let's move to this. So I claim that if you don't have any parallel edges, then the number of phases will be no more than n in the power two of three. We'll use the same trick. We'll use the same trick. Uh, no, first let's let's make all the short phases of the Dini's algorithm. So we find all the paths of of the length one, two, three, and so on up to n in the power two of three. So first, let's make all the short. Let's find all possible short paths. Now all the all the remaining paths has then at least n in power two. Yeah. Now all augmenting paths have length at least n power two of three. So let's draw these paths again. Again, you have these paths. You start from the node S. Now you have one path here. Again, they they may be they may share the same 
vertices, but the edges all are all different. So again, this length is at least n squared. Now again, we will prove that the number of these paths is pretty small. Uh, how we do it? No. We'll do it the following way. Uh, let's draw the blocks of the nodes. So let's find all all, 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 all the first nodes in this path. So let's find all these nodes. Then find all these nodes and find all these nodes. Hmm. Actually, it's a little bit more complicated since you you may have you, different uh, different paths may have the same nodes in different positions. Mm. You can do it more carefully. I'll just keep it for simplicity. It's not not it will not be the com complete proof. It's just a sketch of the proof. Okay, don't judge me. You can do it by yourself. Okay, so. Uh, let's put all these la la layers in this network. Uh, let's calculate the number of nodes in each layer. So let's say this layer has a one nodes, a two nodes, a three nodes, a four nodes, and so. On. Okay, let's okay let's let's do it more carefully. Let's do it more carefully. Let's build a layered network. That's what we're doing actually. Let's build a layered network from S to T. Mm -hmm. And what we, what I will try to end make all these layers. So so these are the nodes with d equal to one, d equal to two, d equal to three, and so on. This d more than n to three. So let's split all the nodes into layers by the distance from S. And now I claim that in this graph there is a cut and size of this cut is no more than n power two three. Well let's prove it. Let's prove it. <clears throat> How to find this cut? Uh, let's try to cut all the edges between the layers. So let's try to cut all these nodes, all edges, all these edges, all these edges, and so on. So what what may be the maximal number of edges between two layers? So the maximal number of edges between these two layers is the just product of the sizes, right? So uh, so yeah, let's say C min is no more than minimum of the cut between layer i and layer i plus one. So if you cut all the edges between layer i and i plus one, total number of edges will be no more than the product of this edge, right? Uh, a i multiplied by a i plus one, plus one, yeah. Okay, now, what, what may be the maximal value of this minimum? Okay, let, let's, let's try to solve the following problem. We have n nodes, so you have like, you have n balls and you need to put them into some number of buckets, yeah? So let's make it here. So you have some buckets, yeah? And you put some balls into these buckets. So th these are your nodes, yeah? So you put nodes into these buckets. Uh, some of all these nodes will be n, yeah? So you have n nodes and you need to put them into these layers. Uh, when this minimum will be the maximal possible? 
uh, yes, you're right. Uh, this minimum will be maximized when all these values are the same. No, or if it's not divisible by so e, so it's so the difference between these sizes must be at least at most one. At most one. Uh, you can prove it just by so if there is one layer and another layer, and the difference is more than uh, one, yeah. you can always uh, move one of them here, and this minimum will be increased, will, will not decrease. Yeah. So, you can prove it, okay. I will not prove it, you can do it by yourself. Uh, so again, so this minimum will be maximized when all uh, layers have the same size. But if all layers have the same size, then the size of each layer is n divided by the number of layers n power 2 square, which is again n power Mm -hmm. And now again, uh, we, we, we know that in this network there is a cut of the size n power 2 over 3. It means that the difference between, again, if we have a cut of this size, we cannot make a flow of the big, of, 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 of a bigger size. Right? So the size of the uh, difference of the flow is no more than size of the cut. So it is no more than n power two. Mm -hmm. And now we use the same logic. If the difference is small, it means uh, in all the remaining phases of the Dennis, we will find at least one of the main paths. Uh, so uh, the number of these phases will be at most n power two or three. Mm -hmm. Nice, that's the whole proof. So let's fix this. So the uh, total asymptotics will be like will look like this. So it will be minimum of square root of m and n in power two over three multiplied by m. Why of no parallel edges? Because I assume that the number of edges between two layers is at most the product of these sizes. If, if you allow to, if you allow parallel edges, you may have edges like this. You may have multiple edges and and more and more and more here and more edges here. So the number of these edges can be more than product of the sizes. <coughs> so this is why I want to forbid the parallel edges. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So okay. if there is no parallel edges, then you, you have some edges, some, some nodes here, some nodes. Total number of edges will be just the product of the sizes. Okay. <laughs> That's all. Uh, now uh, I want to point out this interesting factor in this time complexity. Uh, that's actually quite interesting uh, factor. So you may see this factor in even more complicated maximal flow algorithms. So sometimes if, you, if in some literature you find some, some something about network flow problem time complexity and you see the factor like this, so it's, that's it, this is where it's all uh, from. So, so this factor from time complexities of the maximal flow problem is uh, f coming from all these assumptions, right? Okay. <clears throat> Next, next. Uh, let's now. Now we'll move back to bipartite matchings. So we move back to the bipartite matchings to the first lecture of the semester, and we'll try to improve that algorithm we used.
to find the bipartite matchings. So, okay. Now, okay, let, 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 let's try what, what happened when we try to find bipartite matchings. You have a bipartite graph. You have some bipartite graph. Yeah, something like this, and so on, and something like that. Yeah. And you want to find the maximal matching. So, you want to match the left nodes with the right nodes. So, for each edge, uh, so, so, so the all the edges not share any nodes. Yeah? Very simple problem. We discussed it in the first in the, this semester. So, uh, what we can do is we can reduce this problem to the maximal flow problem. I don't remember if we did it in home task, but it's, it's quite simple. So, you can solve the bipartite matching problem using network flow algorithms. Uh, you do it like this. You introduce two additional nodes here and here, and you make the additional edges from S to all the nodes of the left part, and from the right part to T. And you again, let's, let's orient everything to the right. Now, all edges have unit capacity, and you just try to find the maximal flow in this graph. Mm -hmm. Again, if you find the maximal flow in, in this graph and then look uh, at all edges here, then if the edge is saturated, it must be in the maximal matching. Well, because again, you push at, at most one unit of, of the flow to, to, to the node in the left part, so at least one of this, at, at most one of this node will be saturated and for the right part as well. So uh, you uh, push out of this node one unit of the flow, so at, at most one of these edges will be saturated. So if you find the maximal flow and then look at all saturated edges in the middle, you will find a maximal matching, right? And now we'll try to do, uh, again, if you think about the Kuhn algorithm we discussed in the first lecture, it's actually doing absolutely the same as the Ford Falcon sound algorithm here. Yeah. So, 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 so this actually is the time complexity of the Kuhn algorithm, right? So the, in, in, in the Kuhn algorithm, we did exactly the same thing. Each time we'll try, we try to find the augmenting path. Augmenting path in the uh, sense of the, the, the maximal matching problem is actually the same as augmenting path in this network flow problem. Yeah, can you see it? Okay, I, ho I, I hope it's clear. Um, and now, what we'll do, we'll try to apply uh, all these more complicated algorithms to this uh, maximal flow problem. Since, uh, again, in the first lecture, we, 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 we use a very simple algorithm to find the maximal, maximal matching. We use this, but now we have this algorithm, much more, much more interesting algorithm. So let's try to use this algorithm for this network and see what's, what, what will happen. Uh, first of all, we, we have the graph with unit capacities and no parallel edges, right? So for this graph, time complexity will be at most this. This is already better than this, right? It's strictly better, right? So at least n power 2 over 3 is better than n. But it turns out it, it's even better for this graph. Why is it, why time complexity is better for this graph? <coughs> uh, because of the following fact, again. I claim that if you run Dinitz algorithm in this graph, the number of phases of Dinitz algorithm will be no more than square root of n. Well, let's prove it. Okay, we'll do all the same tricks again. Again, let's run the Dinitz algorithm. First, it will find all the short paths. So first you will find paths of size 1, 2, and so on to square root of n. Yeah. 
Now uh, all the remaining paths has then at least square root of n. So let's draw all the remaining paths. Again, the length of all these paths is at least square root of n. Now I claim that the number of these paths is, is no more than square root of n. Can you see what it, why it is true? Can you see why the total number of these paths cannot be more than square root of n? Again, you need to apply the same, all, all the same ideas we discussed. Again, let us see. So, I want to prove that the number of these paths is no more than square root of n. Uh -huh. That must be because the total size of these paths is no more than n, right? You can find a cut, it's also possible. But it's, 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 it's more complicated. Yeah. So, so, let's do it like this. So, uh, I want to claim that the number of these paths is no more than n divided by the square root of n. To do this, I need to prove that the total size of all these paths is no more than n. Mm -hmm. So we just proved that the total size is no more than m. So this number of edges. And now I claim that in, in, for this graph, the total number of total size of all these paths is no more than number of vertices. No. How to prove it? We'll just prove that all these paths are vertices joints. So, so any vertex can belong to only one of these paths. That's why I draw it like this. Mm -hmm. So in normal graph, we, we may have situation like this. Yeah. So paths, different paths may uh, share the same nodes. I claim for for this graph, this situation is actually impossible. So for each each node can belong to only one of the paths. Can you see why it's true? Why it's impossible to have a situation like this? Can you see it in this graph? That's pretty simple, actually. Okay, let's take some note. Let's take this note. Why can't we have situation like this for this note? <laughs> the LFH particle no, that's not true. No, 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 no. No, the length of these paths is not free. No, 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 no. Uh, no if you if you try to decompose your flow into paths. All paths will have size free, but here we decompose not the flow, but the difference of the flow. So, so this decomposition not of the flow, but of the difference of the flow. So it's the difference between maximal flow and the current flow. So the difference of the flows is the flow in the residual network. In the residual network, they may be paths of size more than three. So again, after you apply some changes here, you will get some residual network. And in this residual network, they may be paths like this. So, again, like in Kuhn algorithm. So that's the possible augmenting path. Yeah, thanks. So for this node, there's only one incoming arc. Yeah, here, here. So there may be no situation like this. Mm -hmm. And for each node in the left part of the graph, there is only one ingoing edge. So each node in the left part of the graph has only one incoming edge. So if there is only one in in incoming arc, then you, you may you, you may have more than one path through this node. It's like look if you think about capacities of the of the vertices. 
So this vertex actually has capacity one. You can't push more than one flow through this network because the, you can't push uh, more than one flow into this node. So the, capa the actual capacity of this node is at most one, if it makes sense. Okay. But what will, what will happen in the residual network? In the residual network, it actually will stay the same. So, so this is your initial network, yeah? So this is your initial network. So this is S, this is your node V. So in, in, the initial net, in, in the initial network, you have only one ingoing edge. Uh, what will happen if you, ha if you have some residual network? We're talking about residual network, right? In the residual network, if you push the flow here, then in the residual network, there will be station like this. So you will, this edge will be reversed and this edge will be reversed. So in the residual network, uh, there's still only one edge uh, going into this node. Yeah? And this happened for all nodes in the left part of the graph. Yeah, one of these edges can, can point to, to the left, but if, if there is one edge pointed here, then this edge must be reversed. Well, it's actually it's quite logical. So uh, it's like the balancing of the nodes stay the same. Yeah. So if you have some node, yeah, there are some ingoing edges and some outgoing edges. So when you push the flow through this node, so you can you like push flow here and here. Basically, what happened in the residual network? Uh, uh, the edge will be removed from the residual network and the reversed edge will be added to the residual network. So basically, when you push the flow uh, through, through the edge, you basically reverse this edge in the residual network, right? Makes sense, right? Again, what happened in, in, in the residual network? You have the edge. If you push the flow through this edge, you basically reverse it in the residual network because now the flow is one, so this edge is removed from, from the residual network and the reversed edge is added to residual network. So when you push the flow through the edge, you basically re reverse the edge uh, in the residual network. Yeah. So, so if you push the flow through this node, you reverse both these edges. And then you reverse both these edges the number of ingoing and outgoing edges will, will stay the same. So this is like the uh, constant property of the node, number of ingoing and outgoing edges, if it makes sense. Yeah, no, 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 no different, don't get it. It's just the out degree and in degree stays the same, right? Um, now, so what? So what? Uh, so so for all for all nodes here, uh, may maybe not only one of these paths, and the same thing for all nodes here. All the nodes in the right part have only one outgoing edge. So all these nodes has in degree one, and all nodes here have out degree one. So all these edges could be land only on paths, uh, one of the paths, and all nodes here could be land only one of the paths. So all of them could belong to only one of these paths. So the total size of all these paths is no more than n. So the number of these paths is no more than n or the square root of n. Mm -hmm. That's all. Okay, let's finalize this. So if you run, if you m m make this graph and then run the Dini's algorithm on this graph, the time complexity of this Dini's algorithm will be square root of n multiplied by the uh, time complexity of the single D phase of the Dini's, it's n. That's all. Can you improve it using link countries? What do you think? Well, here we just improved this type of vector from here to here just using link countries. Uh, 
Actually not. No, because we, we need at least at least M to build this layered network, right? So in each phase of the Dean's algorithm, first we spend M time just to build run BFS algorithm and build also this layered network. So all these link cut trees will not help any here. Yeah. This link cut trees helped us here uh, when we try to find all these paths in the already built uh, uh, layered network. But still, to, to build this layered network, we need to spend M time. Yeah. Yes, right. right. <laughs> That's all. So that's the time complexity of the Hopcraft card algorithm. So, so all this thing is called Hopcraft card algorithm. Uh, so it's just basically it's just the Dean's algorithm run over and step. All right. That's all. I believe it's kind of almost the best possible algorithm known for the bipartite matchings. Let me check. Is there a better algorithm for bipartite matchings? I think not. Uh, let me just read a bit of a joke, a joke, a joke, a joke. Yes, I believe it's the best known algorithm for bipartite matchings. Yes, I believe it's called Hawker Cup because 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 it came earlier than, than the Dini's algorithm. That's the only explanation you can do. Maybe, maybe not. So maybe they first, maybe not. Maybe, 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 I know how it happened. Maybe Hopcraft and Carp just at some point find out that if you run Dini's algorithm in this network, you will get this time complexity. No idea, no idea. All this algorithm has, sometimes has strange namings. It's just, just because that's how the history works. Um, Richard Pank of those algorithms. Can you send me the link? Okay, I'll Google it. This might be interesting. Okay. Okay, I'll read this later. Uh, <clears throat> nice. So we have some time left. Let's discuss pushy label algorithm actually. It's like the bonus bonus for this for all this maximal flows theorem. Uh, let's talk about uh, pushy label algorithm. It's just usually not covered in this lecture, but since we have almost 40 minutes. Let's do it. So push label algorithm is, uh, again, it, it's another way to construct the maximal flow algorithm. Uh, it's uh, very different from everything we discussed before. So it's like just, just different view on all this maximal flow theory. So what happened in all previous algorithm we discussed to find the maximal flow? We just, uh, basically we did the same thing, yeah? So we try to find the augmenting path, then increase the path, the flow using this path, then find another augmenting path and again, increase the flow using this augmenting path and so on. So we like all did the same thing, but with different time complexity. So all we did is basically, we improved the time complexity of finding shortest augmenting paths. We did faster and faster, and at some point we've reached this time complexity, yeah? Uh, Push label is, is something different. So may, maybe again, may, maybe you already have this spot. Uh, so what you can do, you may think. Uh, again, yeah, it's just just to give you some intuition about what's happening. Yeah. So what we did before, we tried to find some path from here to here, 
and then push some flow using this path. And then again, we start from S, find another, find another path, find a, push another flow. Uh, what if, what if you do it in the opposite way? What if you find some edge from S? And let's say you, the capacity is, I don't know, is seven. Let's push seven units of flow to this edge, just from the start. So, so let's start from S and push seven units of the flow to this node. And then see what's going on next. So first we'll push um, m m m much more flow than we actually need. And th then we'll decide what to do next. So we push push bigger amount than we actually need. Then try to redistribute this flow somewhere here. Uh, and then if there is some excess left, we will just push it back. Mm -hmm. So first we push a uh, big amount of flow, just to be sure, yeah? And then if, if there is some excess left, we will just get it back to, to this. That's basically it. The idea of what will happen next. <clears throat> so how the push relabel algorithm works? We will build something which is called a preflow. Preflow is basically a flow with some excesses. So. Uh, <clears throat> uh, okay, it's like a flow. You have a, again. You have your network. Each edge has some capacity, and we will say that the flow for the edge is no more than capacity of this edge. <clears throat> and also we'll maintain the following balancing equation. So here we have a balancing in equation. So we will allow to for the fluid to uh, <clears throat> just like uh, come to, uh, to to the node and do not not, not go a anywhere from the node. So yeah, the balance for the node will be. Uh, uh, let's see. Okay, for for all v for v u uh, is no is at least zero. <coughs> so we will allow the fluid to stay into the node in the node. Yeah. <coughs> so we have some node. We make like eight here and something two here and five here. So five uh, eight units go to the node. Then two units go here, five units go here, and one unit stays in the node. So, so, so there is one extra unit of the fluid inside this node. That's all. No, let, let's call it the balance. So let's call it the balance of the node P. Yeah. So the balance of the node P will be that current not a current amount of the fluid which uh, stayed inside this node v. Now if all the balances are zeros then we have just this regular flow right So if we have zero for all the balances then we have just regular flow. Now what we'll do <coughs> we will add something that's called layers level it's called level so we have layers. Let's add some levels to all the nodes. Let's say level, level. Uh, levels will be assigned the following way. We will assign level uh, N to node S. So, so node S will always stay on the level N. And we will assign level zero to the node T. So these two, la these two levels will be fixed. Uh, uh, node S has always level N, node T has always level zero. And all other nodes will have different layers and they will be changed during the during this algorithm. So so will be initially then row. No. 
Okay, <clears throat> and now we just need one nice uh, invariant. So, okay, the only invariant important for this algorithm is the following. If you have an edge from u to v and the difference between these levels is more than one. So level of v is less than level of u minus one. So this edge goes down by at least two layers. Yeah. Uh, then this edge is saturated. So this is the only invariant we need actually. Mm -hmm. Again, very simple invariant. So if you have the edge, no. What is, the, what is the intuition behind it? Uh, something like that. We will, uh, so the level of the node is not, it's like the height of this node, height of this node, right? So we will try to flow the liquid from uh, from up and down again. So, so you, uh, so we'll, we'll try to move the liquid from uh, nodes with on, on, on the highest level to the nodes on the lowest level. And if this edge goes uh, down by more than one layer level, yeah, then we will always maintain this edge saturated. Something like that. Mm -hmm. That's all. Now, now we'll move to algorithm. Whew. Now the algorithm. Uh, let's start from the simple thing. So let's let, let's draw some graph. Okay, let's have some S. And something here and something here. Oh, that's actually too much. Okay, okay that's definitely enough. So it will be T. Uh, and have some capacities. Let's put 10 here, 5 here. Here, eight here, one here, four here, I don't know, seven here, and three, and a nine, and something, I don't know, and two, something like that. So we have this network. First, we, again, we, we initialize the levels. We say that level of S is one, Wait, 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 not one. It's n. n is one, two, three, four, five, six. Yeah. So level of s is six. Level of t is zero. All other levels are also zero. So it's zero, 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 and zero. Okay. We initialize the levels. Now we need to initialize the flow. How to initialize the flow? Uh, no, we need to maintain this invariant, right? So to maintain this invariant, we need to saturate these edges. So we have these three edges. For these three edges, the difference of levels is more than one. So we need to saturate them all. Let's saturate them. So let's say we have eight units of liquid here, five units of liquid here, and 10 units of liquid here. Mm -hmm. And zeros for everything else. Mm -hmm. Now, this is the correct state of the preflow. Yeah. So, okay. So, this is the initial state of the algorithm. We initialize all levels to zeros, this level to n, and saturate all these edges. Mm -hmm. That's the start. Now, what we'll do next? Uh, so why this, why is it the bad flow? Because some nodes have some excess of the liquid. Huh? So for some nodes, the balance is not zero. So let's take any node with balance more than zero. So let's take any where with BV more than zero. <coughs> well, for example, let's take, I don't know, which one? 
Let's take this node. For example, this one. For this node, the balance is 10. Yeah? So what we can do with this excess? Uh, we can make two operations, basically push and relabel. Uh, first, let's, what happens if we make push operation? If you make push operation like this, you try to push a, the, the excess of the, li of the liquid in your node to some other node. And we will only push the liquid down, the, the, the downward. So, so, we, we will, so, so we have this node V, <coughs> we will find some another node U, <coughs> such that we can push the liquid from here to here. So we will only push the liquid Downward. So, so the level of this U must be below the level of, <coughs> of V. But if difference is more than one, then it's already saturated. So the difference must be one. So we can only push the liquid if the level of node U is level of V minus one. And the capacity of this edge must be uh, more than zero. So we can make operation push if we have some node with non-zero balance and we have some edge to another node with uh, the level one less uh, from, from U, from V, and non-zero remain residual capacity. Mm -hmm. So we take any edge and try to push liquid here. How much liquid can we actually push? Uh, no, no, maximal amount of liquid we can push from here to here. <coughs> yeah, okay. let's, let's, let's. Uh, I don't know how people invent such algorithms, I have no idea. I think they are too smart. So we will increase the flow by the maximal amount. What's the maximal amount we can push? It is the minimum of uh, the balance and the residual capacity. Mm -hmm. well, for example, let's take this node. Yeah. The balance is 10, so we have 10, 10 units in and nothing out. So the balance is 10. Can we push this liquid somewhere? No, actually not. Because there are only these edges, yeah, and uh, the difference of layers is not one. So, so we cannot push liquid from here to here because they are on the same level. So we only push the liquid downward. So, so the level of this node must be below the other. So right now we cannot make push operation. What if we cannot make push operation? If we cannot make push operation, we make relabel operation. Uh, relabel basically makes sure that you have at least one edge to push. So what we, what we can do? We, we can increase the level of the current node, so there will be at least one edge uh, if we, we can push. Yeah. Yeah. So how to? So let's 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 take some edge. So with non-zero remaining capacity. Mm -hmm. So if you want to push using this uh, edge, you need your level uh, be at be level of u plus one. Yeah. So you want to increase your level in such a way that you now you can push using this edge. Uh, and we will increase the level until we find at least one outgoing edge. Uh, well, this basically means that we need to make a level of V minimum of all levels of U plus one for all, for all edges such that there is some remaining capacity here. That's all. That's the whole algorithm. 
Okay, let's see let's see how the how the relabel operation works. So we take this node and we cannot make any push operation. So we make relabel operation. If we make relabel operation, we have three outgoing edges. We, can, we have outgoing edge here, here, and, and basically here, because in the residual network we have the, the reversed edge with capacity 10, right? So we have three outgoing edges for this node. We take the minimum of the levels plus one. So the minimum will be zero. Yeah. So we make plus one. So the level for this node became one. After you make label operation, you can make push operation. Now let's make push from this node. So we have 10 units of liquid here. We can, for example, push them using this edge. So we can push three units of the flow from this edge, from this node to this node. So let's push three units here. Now the balance is seven. So we have 10 ingoing and three outgoing. We can push again. Well, let's push this seven units from here. We can push it using this edge. So we can push seven units here. That's all. Now, now in this node, we, we don't have any excess now. Yeah? So for this node, the excess is zero. That's all. Ah, it's okay. Let's move back here. Let's move back here. <clears throat> I claim that both these operations do not break this invariant. Let's prove it. <clears throat> no, for push operations, it's simple. Push operation do not create anything. Reliable operation, reliable is interesting. Let's let's prove that reliable operation do not break this invariant. Uh, why is it true? No, well, let's see. You have this node V. No, first of all, reliable only increases the level. No, that's quite obvious, right? So if you have some non-saturated edge, so so before you have this unsaturated edge, if it is not saturated, it means uh, that the level of u was greater or equal to the level of v, right? Because it was not saturated and we cannot push. Mm -hmm. So, so if if you have non-saturated edge, then the level must be more than a level minus one. But it is not minus one because we, if it was minus one, we, we can push. Uh, but yeah. So, so we have non-saturated non edge and we cannot push. It means that the level of this u is more or, or equal to the level of v. So reliable operation always increases the level of v. Uh, why can we break this invariant? No, because if you have some saturated edge, if, again, if you have some non-saturated edge, if, if you have some non-saturated edge, you cannot increase the level more than okay. after you make this operation. If you have some non-saturated edge, then the level of V will be no more than level of U plus one, right? Because we take minimum of all these possibilities. So for any non-saturated edge from the node V, uh, the this equation will be satisfied again. Yeah. yeah. And th th that's actually what we need here. So if no, it's the same, but re reverse, right? So, mm -hmm. but here I say I say if this, then it is saturated. So if, if it is not saturated, then this. Yeah. So if the edge is not saturated, then the difference is no more than one. Makes sense. What I was talking about. Yeah, now, yeah. So both these operations do not break the, this invariant. Interesting question. Let's, okay, let's stop here. Interesting question. Uh, why this set is not, is not empty? What if this set is empty? Is it possible that I don't have any outgoing edges with uh, non-zero capacity?
Yes, for edges going into node V, it can break because we increase the level. Yeah. So if there is any edge going into this node, if, if we increase the level of V, uh, this edge cannot break again. So, okay, is it possible that we have some node V? We have some excess of liquid in this uh, uh, node V, and we have no outgoing edge. So for all outgoing edges, remaining capacity is zero. Why it couldn't happen? Here it didn't happen, so I have this 10 liquids and there's pushing here. Yeah, it could happen, it's okay. okay, if V is not T, we don't make this for T, so, so we are allowed to have excess in T, that's basically what we want, right? Yeah, so so all the separations do not apply, in, never, we never apply the separation to S and T, S and T are two special nodes. Okay, the answer here is simple. So, if we have some excess of the liquid in the node, so if we have some excess of the liquid, like, like, like we had here, like in, in this node, so we have 5 and 3, so balance is non-zero. If we have some non-zero non balance, it means we this liquid came from somewhere, and we always can push it back. So, so if you have some node, and you have some flow from here, we have like five units of flow from here. So here you have a non-zero balance. You can always push this liquid back. So in the residual network, you will have this edge of capacity five. It means if you have non-zero balance, you have this liquid coming from somewhere. You can always push it back. Mm -hmm. So this set is always non-empty. You can always push the liquid. If, if, if the liquid comes from somewhere, you can always push it somewhere. Okay. That's all. Now the algorithm. We will apply the separation until we uh, until we can it. So again, if you have at least one node with non-zero balance, we can apply either operation push or operation relabel. Yeah. Yes, we, we apply the separation only with not with excess. Yeah. yeah. Right. Now we apply these operations uh, while we, we have at least one node with uh, some excess. If we if we don't have any excess in any nodes, then we build the maximum flow. Okay, let, let's do it here. So, <clears throat> so again, uh, we have access in this node and in this node. No, let's take, for example, this node. Let's try to do something with this node. Uh, no, we want to push liquid from here. Yeah. So we have uh, eight units of liquid here. We need to push them. So to push them, we first need to relabel it. So let's relabel this node, make it level one. And now we can push liquid here and here. So we have eight units of liquid. Let's put, for example, six here and two here. Mm -hmm. Now this node is balanced. This node is balanced. Now these two nodes are unbalanced. Again, you take any unbalanced node. For example, let's take this node. Here we have balance two. We need to push these two units of liquid. So first we make a uh, relabel operation. So we make relabel operation. Now relabel is one. Now we push liquid here. So we push two units of liquid here. That's all, we're done. Now we don't have any excess here. Now we have this node. Here we have eight units of liquid. Again, we try to push from here. Well, there is nowhere to push. So we make relabel operation. Uh, we have these two edges and this edge. Actually. We have three edges, this and this and this. Uh, so the minimal is one. So we make label uh, two. 
And now we can push. So we have eight units of liquid here. We push it. Uh, let's push one unit here and four units here. Mm -hmm. Now we still have uh, pom, 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 five, three units of liquid here. So this node is still not balanced. And we cannot push here, we cannot push here, we can push here. So again, we make relabel operation. We make rela call relabel operation on this node. Uh, again, the minimal uh, the minimal node we can push to is this node, S. Yeah. So we call relabel for this node and it will change the level of this node to seven. Because this is the only unsaturated edge from this node. So we change level to seven and now we can push using this node. So we can push backwards three units of liquid. So the flow here will be fine. Okay, now finally th this node is balanced. Now again, we take any unbalanced node, for example, which one? This one. And this one. So these two nodes are unbalanced. We take any unbalanced node, for example, this one. Here we have nine ingoing and eight outgoing, yeah. So we have balance one. We try to push this one somewhere. Let's try to push it here. We can't push it here. So we relabel. So we try to relabel this node. Uh, minimal will be one. Now we can push it here or here, right? This both has level one, so we change the label to two. <clears throat> and now we can push this one extra unit of liquid to here or to here. Let's push it, for example, here. So let's push it this unit here. So here now is free. Okay, it may be a long process. Uh, now this node is unbalanced. This is balanced, this one is unbalanced. So we have seven units outgoing and uh, ingoing and two units outgoing. So we need to push seven minus two, five units of liquid from here. So we can't push it anywhere, so we relabel this node. Uh, we relabel this node, so the minimal edge will go here, back. So we can push this liquid from here back to here. We'll talk about time complexity. I'm just doing it very slowly. We'll talk about comp time complexity in a second. So we relabel this node to three. It's actually quite big graph for the whiteboard. And now we push this liquid back. So now here it is zero. So we push all three liquid, all three. Now the balance is still not zero, so balance is two. So we may call relabel again, change, le change level to eight, push two units of liquid back here. Whew, that's almost all. Now this is unbalanced, this is unbalanced. So okay, let's do this. So here we need to push Three units of liquid, yes, so we have three units of liquid. So let's try to push it somewhere. We can push it, for example, here. Yeah. So we change level to ah, we, so, so we put this three extra units of liquid back to this node. Now here we have unbalanced, so we have 10 here, 7 here. So we again call a uh, relabel operation. Ah, yeah, we can push two units here. Whew. Now we still have one unit, so we change this to three, push it back here. Now here we have excess, so we change it to four, push it back there. It's quite boring process actually. Now here we have excess, so we change it to five, push it back here. Now here we change it to, to six, push it back change this to seven, and finally we can push it back here. Seven. It's something like that. Uh, 
That's all. Ah, no, this. Uh, we can. We need to always push one unit here. Ah, uh, two units. Yeah. Whew. Ta da! Finally, that's all. So at some point, we have bal all balances uh, zeros. Yeah. So, so when all nodes are balanced, we build a maximal flow. <laughs> okay. Okay. Two things. Uh, first, let's prove that we actually build a maximal flow. So I claim if all uh, zeros, then we have maximal flow. Okay. Well, let's prove it. Uh, how to prove it? Uh, no, the proof is pretty simple. So we have some flow, for example, for, for, for first of all, right? So if all balances are zero, then we have not pre-flow, but we have a flow. So we have some flow from S to T. We just need to prove that this is a maximal possible flow. We will prove it just by simply looking at the minimal cut. So we'll prove that there is a cut of the same size. Uh, you know, how to prove it? Let's look at all saturated edge in our graph. I claim that saturated edges in our graph forms a cut. Uh, why is it so? Because let's look at any path from S to T. I claim that at least one of these edges is, is saturated. No, why is it true? Because let's look at the levels. So level of S is N, level of T is zero. And we have no more than N minus one edges here. So at least one of these edges must be saturated. Yeah, because there is a, 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 in at least one of these edges, we jump the, down in the levels by at most two, by at least two, yeah. So at least, so if you take any path from S to T, at least one of the edges will be saturated. It means that the set of saturated edges actually form a cut in the graph. And like we proved in the first lecture about maximal flow, if you have a cut of the same as a flow, it means your your, your flow is actually maximal possible. Uh, now let's talk about time complexity. Let's talk about time complexity. Well, let's okay. Let's analyze it. First, let's talk about true labels. Uh, what is the total time spent in all relabel operation? Uh, no, each relabel operation increases the level of the node V. Mm -hmm. Now, what may be the maximal value of, of the label? So let's, let's use some other. So each relabel operation increases the level. Levels cannot be very big. So all the levels cannot be more than 2n actually. No. Why is it true? No. Because first, don't let me think. There must be some simple explanation. Um. <laughs> yeah, because we actually make it as level plus one. So, so there must be a path from S to this node. So, so the, the level of, 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 of any node can be more than S, level of the S plus the distance to this node in the residual network. Yeah. So uh, the length of the path from S to this node can be more than N minus one. So the level of each node can be more than N plus N minus one, actually to N minus one. Uh, so we cannot apply a relabel operation more than n times to any node. Uh -huh. What is time complexity of relabel operation? We need to look at all edges from this node and calculate this minimum. Uh, so the time complexity of this relabel is actually uh, like degree of this node. Right? For a single relabel operation. So the total time complexity of all relabel operations uh, will be like this. So we have 
uh, sum of degrees of all nodes, sum of degrees multiplied by n. Yeah. Sum of all degrees is n. So that complexity will be mn. I don't want to do it here, so I'll put it here. Yeah. So total time complexity of all reliable operations is mn. That's quite good, yeah? That's better than that, what we have in the previous algorithm. Now, let's talk about push operations. For push operations, for push operations, it's a very different story, actually. Uh, in push operations, let's actually write two kinds of push operations, uh, depending on which of these uh, parts is actually minimal. Uh, so first let's discuss what was called saturating push. Saturating push is the push when uh, you push this amount of liquid. So if you push the amount of liquid equals to the residual capacity of the edge. So if you push this amount of liquid through the edge, you actually remove the edge from the residual network. Mm -hmm. uh, if you remove the edge from the digital network, it cannot happen many times. So, okay, so, so, so if you have some edge, and at some point you push liquid from here to here, uh, and this amount of liquid is enough, so this edge became saturated. So it is removed from the residual network. Uh, if you want to put it back to residual network, you, you need to push liquid back here, like an endless curve algorithm. So first. Again, when you push liquid this way, here you have level D and have liquid D plus minus one. Now, when you want to push liquid back, you need to increase this level by at least two. So you have D plus one. So you, so you will be able to move, push the liquid back. Yeah. So the lifetime of this edge looks like this. First, there is an edge. Then you push liquid here, then you push liquid back. Push liquid here, push liquid back. You can do it more than n times because each time you increase the levels. So the number of these saturating pushes uh, <coughs> total number of these saturating pushes will be no more than n for each edge. So we have m edges for each edge, you cannot more you can make more than n saturate pushes. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Again, saturated push is a push when you push en enough amount of liquid, so this edge is removed from the residual network. Mm -hmm. And now finally, non saturated pushes. <clears throat> So non-saturated push is a push when you when then this part is minimal. So you have a big edge, edge with large capacity, uh, but you have small excess. Yeah. So you cannot uh, you cannot saturate this edge. You just push some some amount of liquid to remove your excess, but this edge is still uh, unsaturated. Yeah. Again, again, what happens? You have the edge. Yeah. You have some excess here. So here you have like eight units of liquid, extra units of liquid, and capacity of this edge is twenty. Yeah. So you push this eight units of liquid here. Now you have no excess here, and you just move this excess to the next one. Mm -hmm. So. Non-saturated push do not remove the edge from the residual network. It just pushes the excess from here to here. Why can't we do it too many times? Uh, well, because we actually decrease something. So we all we always push the liquid from the from, from above to, to below. Yeah. So we always. Yeah. Yeah. What happens? 
you have some excess here. Then you make push to remove excess from here and add it to here. So you move the, your excess from the uh, from uh, node with, uh, with, with, with high level to, to node with low level. Yeah? So here level is D plus one, here level is D. So let's calculate the following potential functions. So let's say the potential will be the sum of all these such that B, V is greater than zero. So D in the level of, that's what cost called that. Let's look at the value, which is the sum of all levels of the node with non-zero excess. What will happen with, with this potential? So, uh, when you make non-saturating push, you decrease the potential by one, because you move the potential from here to here. So, every non-saturating push will decrease the potential by one. Right? Mm -hmm. Now, when this potential is increased, it is increased in both relabels and saturating pushes. So when you make relabel operation, you may increase the potential function but because you increase the level of your node. So your node has excess, you may increase this uh, level of this node, so the potential will be increased. Potential can be increased more than n. And if you have m operation, so change of potential in these reliable operations cannot be more than n, okay, let's say n m, n square m, like this. Why is, n, n square is enough. Yes, right. So if, if you look at the, at the movement of the level for each node, each time you increase the level of the node, the, the sum of all this increasing is at most n square, right? Now, what about these saturating pushes? Saturating pushes also increase the potential. So saturated pushes increase the potential because you, you, you push the liquid here, uh, so, so now you had excess here, now you push it here, you still have excess here, but now you also have excess here. So after saturating push, push, you just move some liquid here, so now you have two unbalanced nodes. First you had only a table, now you have this unbalanced node. But every saturated push increases the potential by at most n. Okay. So you, you create one unbalanced node, so the increase of potential will be no more than n. So such rate pushes uh, will change potential, e each time it will change potential by at most n. So it's no more than m n squared. Whew, it's almost all, almost all. Now again, we define this potential function and we look how it, how it changes in this algorithm. It changes in all operations actually. So when you make reliable operation, it increases, but total increase is no more than this. When you make saturating push, you pu push liquid from here to here. So now this node may be unbalanced. So the increase will be at, it will be increased by N. So the total change of the potential by these saturating pushes is more than M square. And when you make non-saturating push, you decrease the potential. So your total increase of the potential is this. So the total decrease of potential can be more than total. But potential is always non-negative. So since all non-saturating pushes decreases the potential and total increases like this, the number of non-saturation pushes can be more than m n squared. That's all, that's all. <clears throat> so total time complexity of all relabels is this, of saturating pushes is this, and all non-saturating pushes is this. 
So this is total length complexity actually, mn square. It can be improved actually. Mm. Again, the only problem we they have is we have too many non-saturating pushes. So we push liquid just here and here and backwards and so on. And sometimes it, it, it may take a long time. For example, if you have if you have a long path like this, and you have some non-negative balance in all these nodes. So now all these nodes have some uh, uh, some 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 excess. So if you if we do just do it in a bit early, if you just take any node with excess and try to push it, you may do it like this. You may push it this excess here. Now you put this excess here, then push it here, then take this node, push it here, then here, then here, and so on. So you, you will have n square number of pushes, right? Uh, <laughs> But it turns out if you do it careful now, again, the, the problem is that we actually do operations in some arbitrary order. We just take any node with excess and try to, to, to push. If you do it more carefully, if you, if you select some special node, for, for example, and actually the best strategy is something like take the node with maximal level, if I remember correctly. So, so, so if you apply some intelligence to this, uh, process of selecting the node to push, then you, you will avoid search like this. So if you just push from left to right here, for example, if you push from here to here to here to here and so on, you will avoid situations like this. So, uh, and if you avoid search, you, you will have something like, if I remember correctly, so, so, so it can be optimized to ask cube. <coughs> or something like that. So ju ju just by just by applying some good strategy for selecting the node we need to relax to do how it's called there's a special pressure for this place to push. So if you just apply some good strategy for selecting the node you need to, you need to push from, you will have a bad time complexity. It's harder to prove, but I actually don't remember how to do it, but something like that. Is different before focus on be faster. Yeah, something like that. Mm -hmm. So we just do do all the same tricks, but when we select the node here, here I say I, I take any node v. If if you take not any node v but the top level node v, you will have better time complexity because of magic. Again, again, just because you avoid situations like this. So in a situation like this, you push it from left to right. Basically, what happened? Whew. Okay, so for today.